You've got mail. Hey, this is really interesting. Jennifer, um, could you ask the older student program if I could meet with them tomorrow? Yes, I'll put a note in Polly and Katie's mailboxes. Thank you. Hey, guys. Hey, Jim. Hi, Jackie. Hey, did you get the watershed email? Yes, I did. Are we going to try the idea? I'd love to. Do you think we can do it? Yes, I do. Well, that's great. As it turns out, I've arranged for a meeting with the older student program group tomorrow. Can you attend? Yes, I'll be there. Do we have a map of the Blackstone Valley watershed? I, I'm sure we can get one. This is going to be great. We're on. We received an email the other day that uh, we want to share with you. And Jackie's going to do that. Um, the email mentioned that the Watershed Texan Association has invited Touchstone to take part in a series of challenges for students your age in schools all across the Blackstone Valley watershed. The, the kind of challenges we're talking about might be something like uh, picking a uh, watershed area and trying to determine where fertilizer went into a river, for example, and then trying to uh, think about how, what kind of productive responses uh, you might come up with to take action against something, something like that. Does anybody know what a watershed is? Uh, great. Uh, Kale? A watershed is an area of land where all the rain and snow um, melt into a particular pond or stream. Great. I brought a map of our watershed, the watershed that the school is in, the Blackstone River watershed. So that's our very immediate connection with the, with the, with the watershed. Why do you think the Watershed Protection Association uh, wants people to be thinking about watersheds and be concerned about them? Caitlin? Um, maybe they want us to pay attention to our watershed because they want us to be aware that there isn't an unlimited amount of clean water for us to drink. We have to protect our watershed from pollution so that the water can be clean enough for us to drink. Great. Yeah, Some, somebody else? Yeah, Andrew? Maybe, the, maybe so that we can protect the animals and plants that live in the water so that the runoff from things doesn't kill them. Good. That sounds like a, a good reason. How will this work? Will everyone be working on the same challenge? Well, you'll be split up into two teams, the blue team and the green team. And each team will get challenges like Dick mentioned earlier. Um, this is going to be a relay. Does anyone know what a relay is? Yes, Jordan. A relay is a race where people take turns running. That is a relay race, but this relay is when members of the same team take turns doing different challenges. There are going to be other schools competing, um, but the focus is going to be on um, helping everyone be aware of, of the environment and how to protect the environment. This is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> what we want to know today is, uh, is whether we, uh, we can take up this challenge from the Watershed Protection Agency. And uh, what I'd like you to do is raise your hand if you think uh, this is a good idea. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We definitely should do this. Well, practically everybody has raised their hands, so I guess that means yes. 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 This is going to be great. I'm not sure I really want to do this. Bye, guys. See you later. Blackstone Watershed Relay. I got a smaller one, too. Also, I got a small one also. I have one, too. And look, Jordan got one. She lives really close to me. I'll give her it. It says here we have to find two wetland habitats near Misco Brook. But why Misco Brook? I think it's because Misco Brook is a part of the Blackstone Watershed. The hell of Misco, since Misco Brook, it, it runs into the West River, and the West River runs into the Blackstone. But what, what I don't get is, what is, what is wetland? I don't know. Well, a wetland, as you call it, is land that's wet a good, t good part of the year. Like, 
a marsh or a swamp or a river or something. Well, anyways, it says we have to find two wetland habitats near Misco Brook, and we have the whole month to finish this project. So that probably means we'll have to spend part of this weekend together. Oh man, I wanted to practice for the bike race this weekend. Mm. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll meet at my house, bring your bikes, and then I'll show you a cool place where we can find some wetland habitats, okay? okay. So it looks like we have to find a neighborhood source of pollution and then tell people so it doesn't get any worse than it is. I heard theirs is about habitats. We have to find pollution. Ugh, this is way more interesting. Yeah, but ours is important. Yeah, look, there's a little red circle on this map here. Oh, cool. It looks like there's lots of development near the conservation land. I wonder if that's causing any problems. Yeah. Hey, let's all call each other and figure out a time we could meet. So then we could, you know, get together and get this started. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, I don't see a single habitat. What are you talking about? This place is filled with habitats. A habitat is a place where animals and plants live. Well, our challenge is to find two wetland habitats. We better find something interesting. Hey, look, a path. Let's follow it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just taking notes about the beaver pond and the changes that the beavers have made to Misco Brook. What kind of changes? Well, this is this structure is a beaver dam, and it's holding back lots of water to create a beaver pond. You seem to know a lot about beavers. I work for Massachusetts Audubon Society, and my job is protecting water resources in the Blackstone River watershed. So I really want to learn more about what the beavers are doing here. You think you could help us? We're doing a school project. My teammates are out there. Hey guys, I found someone to help us with our project. Oh, hi. We were just sketching the area. See, we're all from Touchstone Community School, and our older student program is taking part in the Blackstone Watershed Relay, along with a lot of other schools. We're starting at the top of our part of Blackstone River Watershed and going all the way down to Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, and we're starting here with Miss Cobra. Well, that sounds great. I'm happy to help you. Why is everything flooded over there? Was it always like that? Well, no, it didn't used to be flooded. Actually, these trees back here used to be on dry ground. But yeah, I have a map here. Let me show you what it used to be like. There used to be two small farm ponds. You can see them right here on the map. And then beavers came here to check things out. Then they built their dam to make this huge beaver impoundment, this huge beaver dam. And apparently there was enough here that they liked it and they stayed. I saw on TV beavers cutting down trees and using them for their dams. Beavers are natural engineers who have become famous for modifying their surroundings to meet their needs. So they have built a dam to flood this whole area. The base of the dam is made of mud and stones, and then you can't really see the base because they've piled branches and sticks on top to hold back the water. Wow, that sounds like a whole lot of work for the beavers. How do they benefit from all of it? Well, it increases their food supply. By making the pond bigger, then that allows more aquatic plants to grow. Water lilies are their favorite. And also they eat trees that grow in wetland areas, trees like willows and alder. So you can see they've done a great job here. Can you think of some ways that the beaver dam benefits other animals? Yeah, the dam makes the water deeper, which makes the fish bigger, which is good for the fish and for people who like to catch fish, like me. <laughs> Would larger birds like herons and osprey come to live here? 
Yes, they would, and they do, actually. The, the trees that were on dry land that are now on, in water die because they don't do well being in water, and herons nest in dead trees. So by having many of these trees die, you're making the habitat much more favorable to great blue herons to nest. And actually this morning, I saw a great blue heron fly up here with nesting material in his beak. So it's happening right here. What's the sound I keep hearing? They're American toads yeah. trilling and they're mating right here in the pond. So this is fabulous habitat for them. Thanks. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I'm so glad we met up today. How's your poster going, Jimmy? Pretty good. How about you? Mine's going great. I just did some research a while ago about how animals affect humans, and beavers out of all the animals seem to stand out the most. Yeah, but how do beavers affect humans, though? Oh, well, one of the bigger problems is creating flooding behind the dam. Um, people don't like that a lot, so they can have the town build something called beaver deceivers, which is a pipe that helps regulate the water flow. See, I, I showed it on my poster, and it lessens the flooding behind the dam. My neighbors probably could have used that. Too bad the town put it in too late. Their whole basement is flooded because of the beaver dam. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we're pretty much done with all the things about beavers, and we're ready to share our posters with the class and give them to the Conservation Commission, but we still don't have a second wetland habitat for our project. Remember that night in April we had to help those frogs and salamanders cross the roads? Oh yeah, wasn't it called Big Night when all the amphibians crossed the roads to the vernal pools to mate? Yeah, that was a lot of fun, going around with flashlights and stopping traffic to help the amphibians get across the road. Those salamanders were really big. Those spotted salamanders were so cool. They had that weird way of walking. I remember watching one walk for a really long time. The only thing that didn't blend in with the background was those yellow spots. Why is it called a vernal pool? Why not just a pond or a lake or something? Because a vernal pool isn't there year round. When, see, when it's winter, the snow melts and creates a little pool in the forest. And then once it's summer, it dries up. So it's a good place for amphibians to lay their eggs. I like the paper frogs the most. Remember how we were so afraid that we'd step on one because they're so tiny? And it's really amazing how much noise a one-inch frog can make. What was that other frog, the one that made that quacking noise? The wood frogs. Yeah, those. It's strange that they made less noise than the paper frogs. But I like them. They made a cool sound. Yeah, Big Night was fun. Hey, isn't that the lady who helped us take the salamanders and frogs across the road at Big Night? Yeah. Yeah, her name's Trish. Hi, Trish. Hi, kids. It's good to see you again. Come on, join us. Thanks. Well, we're trying to find two wetland habitats near Misco Brook. And we remember that you were at Big Net when we helped the salamanders and frogs cross the road. And their vernal pool is a wetland habitat, right? Even though it's not wet all year round? Yeah, it's a very important wetland habitat. And this is the perfect time of year to go there. In fact, last night in the vernal pool behind my house, I found 15 salamander egg masses. Wow. So anyway, now you're going to be seeing lots of wood and salamander egg masses in the vernal pool. Well, this will be perfect for our project, but we don't know a lot about frog and salamander eggs. I heard that salamanders and frogs can lay a lot of eggs. Are they grouped together at all, or are they separate, or what? Yeah, the eggs are grouped together in something called egg masses, which can hold between 30 and 1,500 eggs, depending on the species of amphibian. Each egg has in the center an embryo 
Here, let me show you. Each egg has the embryo in the center, which is the beginning, the tiny beginning of the amphibian. Around the embryo, you've got the inner envelope, which is barely visible. And then around that, something larger, which is called the vitelline membrane. With salamander egg masses, you've got them all held together with a big jelly mass, something like this. Wood frogs and spotted salamander embryos are black. Blue spotted salamanders have blue embryos. salamanders have blue embryos and the egg masses will probably be attached to plant stems and there will probably be more than one in the same area. Yeah, but I don't think we're going to find a vernal pool in this pipeline. Yeah, maybe he's right. I mean, like, maybe there isn't a vernal pool down here. Wow, there actually is a pond down there. See it? I think I see some egg masses over there. Are they wood frog eggs or salamander eggs? Can't tell, too far away. Well, remember what Trish said? If they're salamander eggs, there's a jelly coating around the egg mass, but there isn't if they're wood frog eggs. Uh, didn't she say that they could be bunched together? She did. I think there must be about 25 right there, and they're all attached to stems. Let's try and catch them with the net. Here you go, Hutch. There's like an extra jelly layer on the eggs. Salamander eggs, right? Yeah, they're a lot bigger than I thought they would be. And they're all huddled together inside that extra layer. They almost seem as if they're glowing. I think we should put them back. Yeah. Wait, let me take a picture. It looks like there are frog egg masses over there. Do you want to try, Victoria? Sure, but um, before we go, it looks like the sun just came out, and I'm getting pretty hot, so we should probably take off our raincoat. Good idea. Okay, here I go. <laughs> it's not that easy. I think they make the eggs must have been laid on a small branch or something. Ooh, got it. Doesn't look like there's an envelope around them. Should be wood frog eggs, right? Yeah, they look like little marbles of jelly with seeds inside. And they're all bunched together, and it looks bumpy on the surface. Well, I should probably put it back now that we're done. This is so cool. Let's go to my house. We can finish our notes up there. OK. Thank you.
So we're here at the Hennessy property and we have to find a neighborhood source of pollution that's contaminating Misco Brook. And then we have to inform people so it doesn't become a real threat. I don't get what you have to do with this. It's not like it actually involves us. Well, all water is connected. If one person pollutes it, then it can affect everyone. Yeah, because Misco Brook goes into the West River, which goes into the Blackstone, which flows into Narragansett Bay, and then it goes into the sea, which just proves that all water is connected. Right, so I went online and I found an aerial photograph of the area. And it looks like if we just go down this road right here, we'll get to um, Misco Brook. So, cool. we go? Yeah. Hey, this photograph was taken before the development was there. Oh, you're right. Uh, I know this would be boring, but whatever, let's go. Uh. Wow, I never thought it would look like this. So big. Me either. Hey, look, a Canada goose. Whoa, that's so cool. Hey, look, there are some ducks. And look at those spiders. They're so cute. Maybe this won't be so bad after all. Are you okay, Drake? I think he's scared of spiders. Oh. Is that a spider on the water? No, that's a water strider. I live down the water without thinking. I think it's called surface tension. Yeah. Basically what happens is the water molecules want to stay together, so it creates a kind of elastic surface. The tension between the molecules isn't really that strong, but if you balance some things correctly, they'll just like sit on top of the water. How do water striders do it though? It seems like they're fairly heavy and they move around. Yeah, water striders are too heavy to stand on the water. But their legs are built in a special way with this kind of wax, and they have little hairs that like trap the air. So that just helps them stay on top of the water. What's that orange stuff in the water? Oh, gross. That dead fish? That's what it looks like. I bet this water is polluted. Let's go and see where it's coming from. And we'll figure that out how. Oh, wait, Drake, can I see the aerial photograph for a minute? Sure. I thought so. There's a little creek thing here. I bet that's where it's coming from. Okay, let's go. where the water is coming from. It looks like all the dirt eroded into there. What is eroded? Erosion is when all the dirt gets carried away by the water as far as it can go. Anyway, after the dirt gets eroded, it goes through the pipe, into the pond, down the creek, and into Misco Brook. And it might be what's causing all the other problems, like killing the fish and creating the orange gunk and other things. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and remember how the Habitat group was talking about how they had help from Donna Williams from the Mass Audubon Society? Yeah. Why don't we see if he could help us too? That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Yeah. Hey kids. Hey Donna. Thank you for coming. We have a few questions for you. About some orangey gunk we saw in the water. It's right here by this deer trash. Actually, that's not so bad. Really? Yeah, it's not even pollution. And it's caused by something called iron oxidizing bacteria. So it's not so bad. Really? It's so disgusting. Well, I have an idea. How about if the four of you grab some water samples from different streams around here 
and we can check them for turbidity. We can get water right here from the orange gunk and that can be our first sample. Then we put them in the, a turbidity machine and we can compare the results. What's turbidity? Turbidity is the cloudiness in water. Often it's caused by dirt, but it can be caused by other substances. And the problem with dirt in water is, as the water gets darker, the temperature raises. Uh, the darkness absorbs heat from the sun. So by the temperature of the water going up, it holds less oxygen. And the critters that live in water really need oxygen. The more oxygen, the better. So we want to keep water cool to keep more oxygen in the water. And then another problem with dirt or turbidity is that the dirt is, gets into the fish's gills. Mm -hmm. It clogs their gills, so they have trouble breathing. Wow, that sounds really bad. I mean, like... Well, and we could have a problem from this new construction up here on the side of the hill. Mm -hmm. But I'll go to my car now and get the turbidity meter. Okay. Okay, let's split up and get some samples. I'll go with Jordan, and we'll get some samples by the drain pipe over there, where we were the other day. And Drake, you go with Robert to get some samples here and by those bushes over there. Okay, this sounds sort of fun. Yeah, let's go. Okay, yeah. let's go meet at the tree when you're done. Sure. Okay, I got it. Cool, we got our two samples. Okay. Go. Hey guys! Hey, hi. We already tested our two samples. It's so oh. cool. Here it is. Okay, let's see what we get here. 129. So the cloudy water could absorb heat from the sun, and then it would have less dissolved oxygen for the little critters that live in the water, and then there'd be dead little critters. That's right. And all the dirt could be coming from the drains in the development? That's right, yep. But it's not just the dirt from the development that we have to worry about. All the people park their cars up there on their driveways, and then, of course, they travel on the roadways. If someone has an oil leak or a gas leak or an antifreeze leak, or if many people do, then that gets on the pavement, and then when it rains, all that stuff washes down over the roads into the storm drain system and then into Misco Brook. So there might be long chemicals coming down the hill also. That's right. What do you mean by long chemicals? Well, fertilizers for one. The commercials convince us that we have to have really green lawns for our lawns to be good, but that's one of the pollutants that goes into our streams. And then there are other things like pesticides and herbicides that people use on lawn. Pesticides are a chemical that people use to kill the insects in their lawn that they don't like. And herbicides are people use to kill weeds in their lawns. Mm -hmm. But then if it rains and all that extra herbicide and pesticide gets washed into the brook, then you can kill the aquatic weeds in the brook or pond. And also you can kill the insects and fish eat those insects, so then you're really depriving the fish of, mm. of their food. I never knew any of this. Well, a lot of people don't know this. Does that mean that people have to be especially careful when they're living on hills? Yes, it does. And actually, we're lucky here in Grafton because the town has bought all of the Hennessy land here, this 124 acres, oh. and the Water comes down the hill from the development into the field, and then the runoff that can be harmful gets filtered through the ground and the roots of the plants. So this is really helping to protect the brook, all of this protected area. Is that why the turbidity breathing down by the brook were lower? That's exactly right. It's great that the land on this side of the road is protected and will stay mainly undeveloped. Maybe if the people in those houses up there knew about how bad this was for the environment, they wouldn't be um, using herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers so much. Well, how could we tell them? Well, some people who are concerned with water quality put small signs on the storm drains that say, don't drum, 
Don't dump drains to wetland. And I think you can order them over the internet. We should do that. Yeah. 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 Really cool. yeah. yeah. Check it out. Let's label this one. Look at all the runoff going into it. Oh yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Hmm. Okay, so here's the first direction. Make sure the application surface is clean, dry, and flat, which probably means we have to clean it off. Check. Yep, okay. On the back of the marker, starting one-eighth from the edge, apply a bead around the entire edge and then spiral it into the center. And press down hard. <laughs> okay. No dumping. Drains to wetlands. Looks good. Yeah. 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 Yay, we did one. Hey, you know, from here you can really see how the beaver dam is affecting Miss Go Brook. You can see which trees are all dead and all that stuff. Well, now new species can live there, like the great blue heron we saw. I hope labeling drains helps. Yeah. Now that we're almost done, I wonder what the other group's challenges are going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Sorry. Put a spider on your ear. It's alright. It's really <laughs> gross. Oh. <laughs> Jackie, did you get the watershed uh, email? Yes, I did. And I like it. Oh, jeez. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so there probably won't be fish in there. Yeah, and it's open water, so we'll probably see sal er, egg masses in there. Let's try that one more time. Killed it! Too bad we don't know enough about... Oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll probably see egg masses. I'll take a picture. Ha <laughs> ha
I totally forgot the end. I couldn't. I totally. Isn't he great? See, this is what you can do after you retire. This is.